We'd like to thank everyone for joining um, today's Masters in 504 training. Um, it's just about 11 o'clock here now, so we'll get started. Um, just a few housekeeping items for you all. Um, first of all, current SBA turn times at the Sacramento Loan Processing Center, uh, things are really moving pretty quickly over there on small loan sizes. We're seeing turn times within like 12 to 24 hours, um, as long as that's occurring during the, uh, the business work week. Um, and then on those larger projects, we're seeing one to two business days, which is great on those more complicated structures where we might have some correspondence back and forth with the center. Um, for those of you that are really well acquainted with the operations of the Sacramento Loan Processing Center, you'll know that our communications with them previously were kind of designated between an avoid a screen out, which gave us 24 hours to kind of turn things back in before things got pushed to the back of the line, um, or just a screen out, which um, that meant it did get pushed to the back of the line to, to reevaluate. Um, the center has done away with the avoid a screen out and rather are communicating with our loan officers and processors directly through email communication and also phone calls. So we're seeing a lot more communication with the center, which is greatly appreciated from our side. Um, they're also more readily available than they have in the past for us to ask questions up front. So we wanted to make you, our lenders, um, aware of that increased communication and then also the time frames that we've got going on. Also, um, we're going to continue this Masters in 504 series with a follow-up of kind of uh, 10 for 10, what we're calling it. So we'll have 10 discussion items that will be reviewed in 10-minute segments, Some, something that will be more readily available for you to just sit down and, and learn a, a little quick hit on the SBA 504 program and how Mountain West operates. Um, to that end, there was a survey in this invitation for today's webinar where we would like to invite you to fill out that survey that will help us know better what topics you, our lenders, are looking for from us so that we can more readily tailor those for you. Um, our next training will be on June 22nd where we will cover refinance and that will be offered by Curtis Singleton. So be looking for that invite. Um, we're very grateful to Spencer Davis for um, tackling today's affiliation update. Um, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised with what SBA has come out with. Uh, Spencer Davis is our senior lending officer, um, and I'm pretty sure he's been working at Mountain West since he was three. So we'll turn that time over to Spencer. And I'll be uh, monitoring the Q&A and also the chat feature. So if you have any questions, be sure to pop it in there and I'll relay those to Spencer or at the end, we'll tackle those in the Q&A. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Danny. And welcome everybody. We've got a good group of attendees already. And uh, I hope you're all as excited about the affiliation update as I am. So as Danny mentioned, I'm Spencer Davis. I'm our senior lending officer. And let's get into these slides. So effective May 11th of this year, uh, SBA has revised the affiliation rules for their various programs. This impacts 504, 7A, microloan, their various other programs. Now it should be noted that there is a little bit of pushback coming from uh, the industry, coming from certain segments of uh, Congress uh, in regard to these affiliation rules and other rules that uh, SBA has proposed. Um, so we don't know if any of these will be adjusted in the future, but as of now, these rules are in place they're active. We've already had loans approved using these new rules. So, and we are very excited about them. 
So let's let's just talk a little bit about what has changed. Uh, the the principle of control that has changed when we are looking at affiliation. That used to be the main thing that SBA looked at. They were so focused on all of the different ways that a business could be controlled from someone internally or possibly from someone externally. So that has changed, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, it expands the regulatory definition of ownership to establish thresholds of ownership at which SBA considers an applicant to be affiliated. So really what it's doing is we're looking at percentages of ownership. Uh, and that is our main focus with this. It's, it's actually quite simple once you sort of break it down and wrap your mind around it. So affiliation will no longer be established through uh, stock options, management or management agreements, identity of interest between close relatives, franchise, license, or similar agreements. Uh, SBA will no longer publish the SBA franchise directory and SBA lenders no longer provide franchise ID and E-TRAN. Okay, so those are some pretty significant changes. Um, well, what hasn't changed? The CDC still needs to determine that a franchise agreement, a fuel supply agreement, a dealership agreement, management agreement, et cetera, are all still eligible. So this doesn't take away the need to review these types of agreements. We still have to review them to make sure that they're eligible. The only thing it does is it no longer creates concern about potential affiliation. A couple of points of interest. Uh, as we're going through these, these rules, you'll see, uh, you'll see the mention of applicant quite often. Uh, and the SBA defines applicant as any person, firm, concern, corporation, partnership, cooperative, or other business enterprise applying for any type of assistance from SBA. Uh, really, the, the easiest way to sort of wrap your mind around it is just to consider the OC as our applicant. So for projects involving an EPC and an OC, uh, they are considered as a single business. And all affiliation is based off of the OC. And it's always the NEICS code for the OC that we are focusing, focusing on when we're determining affiliation. So let's just jump into a few examples uh, that SBA has uh, given us to help us understand what these rules are. Uh, so here's the first one. When an applicant owns more than 50% of another business, the applicant and the other business are affiliated. So really simple. Uh, for a project that we might be looking at, let's say uh, in this example, Macmillan Inc. is the OC for our project. Macmillan Inc. happens to own 100% of structural dynamics piping. Okay, so they are affiliates. Uh, it's that simple, point A to point B, that simple, okay? I had a big question about how do we handle affiliation with, with pass-through entities? As you all know, we see a lot of loans that are structured with pass-through entities. Are they going to be considered affiliates? Are they not affiliates? How do we figure that out? Uh, so this next rule that SBA provided helps us understand this. So first, if the pass-through entity owns more than 50% of the OC, the pass-through entity is an affiliate, okay? Second, if the pass-through entity owns over 50% of any other entities, so any other entities aside from the OC, those entities would also be considered affiliates if any of them operate in the same three-digit NAICS subsector as the OC. So let, let's look at an example of how this works. So you'll see in the blue box, this is our applicant. This is going to be our OC for the project. It's Bobby's Brazilian Grill. It's owned 51% by Redbird Holdings. 
So that is our pass-through entity. Uh, because it's owned over 50%, then that entity, Redbird Holdings, would be considered an affiliate for our project, okay? Uh, then let's look at some other potential affiliates and how they might be impacted by this. So when we look at Bobby's Brazilian Grill 2, that's in the green box, 75% uh, is owned by Redbird Holdings. Um, and so, so first we see, okay, that potential affiliate over 50% is owned by our pass-through entity. So it, it potentially could be an affiliate. The thing we have to then check is the NAICS code. And you look at the first three digits of the NAICS code, we see it's 722. So the, you look back at the original applicant at the OC, and we see that it's actually got the same NAICS code. The first three digits are what matter to match up, but this one would be an affiliate because it's owned over 50% by the pass-through entity, and the two entities have the first three digits of the NAICS code matching. So then let's look at a, a couple of other affiliates here, uh, potential affiliates, Bobby's Brazilian Grill 3. So in this case, it's not an affiliate because the pass-through only owns 25%, okay? So we do not have to treat that as an affiliate. Uh, the last potential affiliate would be Anfield Land Holdings, and it's 100% owned by the pass-through. So that, that checks. Then we look at the NAICS code and we see that the first three digits do not match. So it is not an affiliate. So for this loan, there would be two affiliates, the pass-through entity itself and the other entity that's owned by the pass-through, Bobby's Brazilian Grill 2. Okay. So how do we handle affiliation for individuals? Okay. Uh, first, check to see if any of the individuals, uh, or if any individual owns more than 50% of the OC. Okay, that's the first thing we look at. Second, if they do, we check to see if this individual owns more than 50% of any other entities. Okay, so if you have an individual that owns over 50%, what you need to do is start looking at any other entities that they may own and check to see if they own over 50% of any of those. Third, if, if they do, then we go back to the NAICS check. We check to see if the first three digits of those potential affiliates, the first three digits of the NAICS code for those potential affiliates matches the OC. So let's look at an example. So our OC for this project is Wayland Forklifts Industrial. So it's owned 100% by Ellen Ripley with the NAICS code starting with 333. So there's two potential affiliates. The first one is Advanced Robotics. So it's owned 70% by Ellen Ripley. So because it's owned over 50% by Ellen Ripley, this is a potential affiliate. And the next thing we check is those NAICS numbers. So 333, which matches the OC. So yes, that is an affiliate. The second potential affiliate is Nostromo Inc. Again, owned 100% by Ellen Ripley, so possibly an affiliate, but it's not in the same NAICS subsector. Okay, the 336 and the 333 obviously don't match. So this affiliate is, this potential affiliate is a non-affiliate. Okay, what if nobody owns more than 50% of the OC? So what happens in this situation is that we then drop this check to those that own over 20%, okay? So we might have a mix of owners that are individuals or business entities that own 20% or more of the OC. It's really important to note that we only do this, we only drop to the 20% level if there's not a single individual or business entity that own over 50%. You don't have to do both, okay? Uh, so first let's look at what we do if the OC 
uh, the owner of the OC, if there's a 20% owner, that's a business. Okay, so in this example here, our OC is Shady Acres Nursing Home. It's owned 46% by Nursing Homes by How, and then it's owned by a few individuals as well. The only one that meets the that meets the uh, what we need to see here, the only one who's over 20% is a business. It's a pass-through entity. It's this nursing homes by how. So we we start to do our affiliation check based off of that. Um, so we look at, in this case, um, all we're looking at, when it's a business, all we're looking at is the NEICS code, okay? Um, and so when we look at the potential affiliate here, Nursing Homes by Hal, we see that it has uh, an identical NAICS code. It doesn't have to be identical, only the first three digits need to match, but in this case, they happen to be an identical business. Okay, so the pass-through entity that is also an operator of an assisted living at another location that entity would be considered an affiliate. Okay, the non-affiliate in our example here uh, is Hal's Arts and Crafts. Uh, the ownership really uh, doesn't matter too much. And in this case, when it's a business that, that's over a 20% owner of the OC, what we're looking at is the NEICS code. So in this case, the first three digits are only 314. They don't match the OC, so it's not an affiliate. Okay, let's look at the same situation. There's no, there's no one that owns over 50% of this business. So we're gonna look at who has over 20% ownership. Uh, so in this, in this example, our OC is in a tech, all right? There are three owners that have over 20% ownership. So we're going to do this affiliation check for all three of them. Okay, so in this case, we're going to see, we're going to, you know, we do our analysis and we see that Bill does not have any potential affiliates. So we're going to drop down to Joanna. So Joanna does have a potential affiliate, affiliate called Chachkis. Okay, so she owns 100%. All right, so that is a potential affiliate because she has over 50% ownership. Now we're going to look at the NAICS code, 722. It does not match the NEICS code for ROC, so it's not an affiliate. We look at as well um, the potential affiliate uh, called Bob and Bob's Consulting. So this is owned 50% by Bob Slidell and 50% by Bob Porter. Now, when we look at it, we see that there that Bob Slidell is not over 50% owner of that affiliate. So even though the NEICS code matches, those first three digits match, it, it's not an affiliate because Bob Slidell is who we're doing the check on. That individual does not own over 50% of that affiliate, of that potential affiliate. So it is a non-affiliate, okay? So here's where it gets really interesting. So what do we do if there are no 20% owners? Okay, so in, in this example, our OC, our applicant is the Grand Hotel. There are a mix of individual and business entities that are the owners of this OC, but none of them are over 20%. Um, so, in this case, there are no affiliates. So when we have a project where no one has 20% or more ownership, there are literally zero affiliates associated with that project. So even though they own a few other hotels, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Those are not considered affiliates. Okay, so there will literally be zero affiliates associated with this project.
So there's some interesting ramifications that come from this. Okay, so the question that we had was, how do these new affiliation rules impact aggregate SBA loan balances? Okay, so here is how we figure out um, the lending authority that an individual can have from the SBA, how much money they can have borrowed from the SBA at any one time. So for, and this is specific to 504, 7A is actually identical except for the energy public policy and the small manufacturers uh, clauses. Uh, but this is basically the same rule. So for all 504 projects, except for eligible energy public policy and projects for small manufacturers, the gross debenture is limited to an outstanding balance of 5 million maximum in aggregate for each small business concern, including its affiliates, okay? So aggregate loan balances are based on the OC that is getting the loan and its affiliates. So if the OC has no affiliates, we only need to look at the aggregate SBA loan amounts for that OC, all right? So in the example that we gave of this hotel, they had four other potential affiliates and we determined that none of them are affiliated because none of the owners were over 20 or 20% or more, okay? So what if the Outlook Hotel and the Bates Motel each have an outstanding SBA loan of 2.5 million. So combined, they're hitting that 5 million total. Well, since they're not affiliates, that aggregate does not count against the OC, okay? So that is a very interesting change that will, we'll have to keep an eye on this to see how SBA reacts to this, uh, but, it makes things a lot easier in our world for sure, okay? Uh, just to give a little more detail on a loan like this, where we're working with a borrower, where there is not a single individual or business entity that has 20% or more ownership. Uh, the SBA would still require at least one of those individuals involved to step up and provide a personal guarantee on the loan. But even though they are providing a guarantee, that does not mean we have to start looking at potential affiliation for that individual. We still have zero affiliates and we don't have to count any SBA lending that that individual may have outstanding on other non-affiliated uh, properties. Okay, well, what if the business is owned by related parties, such as spouses, brothers, sisters, in-laws, parents and adult children, parents and minor children, cousins, best friends, business part partners, all different kinds of relationships. How does that impact the, these affiliation rules? The only relationship that SBA is concerned about is the relationship of spouses and minor children. So if we're working on a loan where there are spouses that hold ownership and minor children that may or may not hold ownership, we have to combine the ownership of those individuals. Uh, and from there, we start doing the, well, do they own 50% of any other businesses? So here, here's our example. So our OC for this project is Velvet Touch Car Wash. It's on 25% by Walter, 25% by his spouse, Skyler, and 25% by their minor son, Walter Jr. So the combined ownership, when we're looking at affiliation, would be 75%. So then we look, start looking at other businesses. Does Walter have any other businesses that he owns? Does Skylar have any other businesses that she owns? We need, to, we need to look at both. So our potential affiliates for this project would be Vomino's Pest, where 
Uh, Walter, who's really the only one we're concerned about, is only a 33% owner. So because he does not own over 50% of that entity, we are not concerned at all about it being an affiliate, okay? The other potential affiliate that we have here is Sky Blue Enterprises, all right? In this case, Walter is uh, over 50% ownership. He's at 51%. And so, okay, possible affiliate, we need to check out the NAICS. So in this case, NEICS is 325 pharmaceutical manufacturing, and it does not match up with the NEICS code for the OC. So it would not be considered an affiliate. When determining the percentage of ownership that an individual owns in a business, the SBA considers a pro rata ownership of entities. Okay, so we have an example here. Our applicant is Entertainment 720. Uh, and it's owned by a mix of individuals and a, a pass-through entity. Okay, so uh, Jean Ralphio owns 35%. Tom Haverford owns 15%. And then Rent-A-Swag owns 50% of the OC. Okay, so then we look at the ownership of Rent-A-Swag and it's owned 100% by Tom Haberman, okay? So what SBA would say is that we would need to combine the ownership, the individual ownership that Tom Haverford has with the ownership of Rent-A-Swag or his personal ownership in Rent-A-Swag. So it would be 15% plus 50% for a total of 65%. So SBA would say, we need to look at Tom Haverford individually to see if there are any potential affiliates that he has personally. Okay, so I'm gonna test your knowledge on this, uh, on these rules that we've gone through. Uh, just take a second to think to yourself what the answer to this question would be. So Alexis owns 100% of the OC. Her spouse, Pete, owns 100% of his own business. Are these two businesses affiliated? So the answer is no. Uh, Alexis owns 100% of the OC, and she owns 0% of her spouse's business. So these two businesses would not be considered affiliated, okay? Okay, somewhat similar situation. Alexis owns 90% of the OC and Pete owns 10% of the OC. Alexis and Pete are spouses. So we know, okay, we've got to combine the ownership and we need to look at a, a potential affiliation for both Alexis and Pete, okay? So Pete owns, 100% of another business. Are these two businesses affiliated? Okay, think about it. Uh, the answer is maybe. So it depends on the NEICS code of the OC and the potential affiliate. So Pete would meet the ownership test. He owns over 50% of that other entity. And then it'll come down to the NAICS. We're going to look at the first three numbers of the OC and of that potential affiliate and see if they match. If they do, then they're an affiliate. If they don't, then they're not an affiliate. Okay, when you have an OC with multiple owners and none have ownership of 20% or more, will this loan have any affiliates? So the answer on that is... No, there will be no affiliates for this project. Okay, can an OC change their ownership in order to make themselves eligible? Okay, so if we're running into a, an issue um, for whatever eligibility reason that this is causing, uh, if, if they were to make a change to their ownership 
to get around that rule, or I guess better said, to come in compliance with, with a particular point of eligibility, can they do that? The answer is yes, but the six month rule still applies. So as you know, if there are any changes to ownership that impact uh, guarantees on the loan, then they must wait six months before they are able to apply for an SBA loan. Okay, can the CDC resubmit a loan that was previously declined due to whatever reason because of affiliation? So if we had a loan that we submitted, um, perhaps we, we didn't, uh, you know, maybe we interpreted a rule differently than SBA and we ran into a, a size standard issue, okay? And that loan was declined and unfortunately we, we couldn't move forward with that loan because we couldn't get, we couldn't get come into compliance with that rule of eligibility. Well, now that these rules have changed, does that open up the opportunity for us to try to resubmit that loan and get it approved? And the answer is yes. Uh, we are now able to do that. But if the resubmission involves a change of ownership, again, we would have to wait for that six month period before we could submit. Um, before we jump into questions, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we have, as I mentioned before, we have started submitting loans to SBA already. And uh, we had loans that had multiple of, of multiple affiliates that we were working on prior to these rule changes becoming effective. And now that they've become effective, you know, we've gone in and made adjustments to our write-ups. One example that I can share is that uh, a write-up was over 90 pages that included a whole bunch of affiliates. After these rule changes, uh, that memo is now 40 pages. So a significant amount of work that we were doing on projects that used to involve multiple affiliates are becoming much more simple and a lot less work is going into them, which will help increase our turn times. So we're, we're quite excited about that. Okay, Danny, do we have any questions? So we've been answering most of these on the fly, um, okay. just in the chat here. Um, I'm sure it wasn't distracting to you at all as like message bubbles were popping up as you were trying to talk. Man, I was, um, I was laser focused. You were in the zone, baby. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over these um, just for the benefit of the group really quick. So the first was um, Manuel Bueno popped in here. Do you still need to submit the franchise agreements to review or do we review those in house? So the answer that we gave there is that at time of application, it is an in house review um, for us to determine. And then the SBA closing attorney uh, reviews that determination at closing. Um, we've had some back and forth in our loan officer group about seeing if we can't. Um, talk to the SBA district office here if there isn't a way for us to review those earlier on in the process. So we'll get back to everyone on that. I see John Gigi's here. So, hey, John, what do you think? <laughs> one, 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 one additional point on that uh, that came up at NADCO was what SBA would like us to do when we, we are reviewing these types of agreements is to keep in mind um, the SOP rules about a passive business versus an active business. And as mm -hmm. we're reviewing these agreements, um, we need to try to think, are there any hot button issues that would make, uh, that would make us consider the OC to be passive? Are there anything, is there anything that the franchisor or the management group is doing that is going to turn them essentially into a passive business? Um, I reached out to NADCO to get a little more information on this. They said that they're having open discussions with SBA and uh, SLPC about this, and they're hoping to put together a little bit more guidance 
uh, for the CDCs so that we know exactly what we should be looking for. Uh, and our fallback, John, sorry, our fallback is if we are not quite sure, we're gonna be reaching out to you with lots of questions. <laughs> John, sure John, has already, John has already entered the chat that he's gonna check on a, an earlier review. So that'll be great. Um, uh, Chris Adams asks, do we rely on the NAICS code form from the tax return or the code that best represents the borrower's current operation? So just great question. Short answer is yes to both. Um, we'll default to the tax return just because it's easiest, but if uh, the CDC and the lender and the borrower think that that NAICS code that's listed on the tax return is not accurate, um, we can memo the file and kind of do the affiliation test that way. Yeah, so great question. Same question came up at NADCO. Um, the consensus was, uh, let's go off of the tax return. If that's not accurate, which a lot of times it's not. I mean, sometimes we, we look at any ICS codes that aren't even active anymore. And so in those types of situations, what we need to do is work with the borrower to determine what the most accurate any ICS code is. And we could very easily write a memo that this is the any ICS code for this project and have the borrower docu sign it. SBA said that would be acceptable. Okay, great. Um, this, this kind of pertains to as Mountain West footprint has grown, we have different kind of state rules that get involved here. So we had this question, does the ownership matter in a community property state? To which I quickly replied, I will Google what a community property state is. <laughs> so uh, essentially what it, it boiled down to is that a community state is anything, property, company, anything that is obtained during marriage becomes ownership of both parties in the marriage, regardless of ownership percentages. So the response there is, this is an SBA rule, not anything that is, or a SBA test, not anything that has to do with who requires a guarantee, the different deeds of trust, mortgages, all that stuff. So it's our opinion that it, it really doesn't matter, this community property state example, because um, the SBA is just going to be going off of the Schedule E, K1s, the ownership that we kind of show in the test there. So that's just kind of the response that we had to that. Um, let's see, last question, back to franchises is the review that we're performing on these franchise agreements, um, are you reviewing these just for eligibility issues rather than control and affiliation? Um, and the example given is like a Curbs franchise would not be eligible since it only focuses on one demographic population of women. And so the, the answer to that is yes, like this is more of an eligibility review as it pertains to the franchise. Um, the one that we see the most is property management agreements with hospitality industries, where it's very obvious that the employees are not employees of the small business concern, but rather the franchise itself or the property management team itself. So those are the kind of things that we are reviewing for accuracy and eligibility. Okay, let's see, I think... That is I it. see Brett has his hand up. Was that, or, or, did we answer his question? Brett, could you type your question into the chat? If not, we can take your question offline. Okay. Wonderful. Any summation, Spence, that you'd like to provide? No, just, I mean, anecdotally, it's been, it's been very pleasant. I mean, I love these changes. Uh, as we've been reviewing credit memos, uh, it's been interesting to go through them and identify, well, that's not an affiliate. Yeah, this one's still an affiliate. 
and just see how it's impacting the overall structure of the loan. Uh, so, you know, very, in our opinion, very positive changes. Uh, it's going to make this a lot easier for the small business owner to apply for an SBA loan. Um, it's going to cut back on a lot of the paperwork. Uh, so really helpful. Uh, we're working on sort of a, a flow chart kind of document that we will be happy to share with all of our lenders that kind of, you know, prompts you when you're looking at who might be a potential affiliate, helps you uh, identify what those may or may not be. So we'll, we'll, we'll get that circulated once we have that ready to go. Great. Um, two other questions that rolled in here. Um, if another company that the borrower owned is not considered an affiliate, do you not need their financial information for size standard? Question mark. Any reason to get those non-affiliated business financials? So for size standard, no, they're not an affiliate. We do not need to collect for that specific reason. Um, we still need to be prudent lenders. We still need to make good credit decisions. And so what I would say is that if we're looking at, uh, typically what we do when we're looking at potential of affiliates, we look at the Schedule E. And I realize that is not exact information that we're looking for, but it might show a large loss uh, on one of these non-affiliates. Um, we discussed this with SBA at NADCO and their response was be prudent lenders. If you see anything that might be of concern, you should collect that tax return uh, and just make sure that there's not a potential non-affiliate company that could drag down the, the OC, drag down the applicant. So it's, it's more of a, a judgment call as you, the lender, is, is there anything that you're reviewing or identifying in this package that it's making you nervous about one of their other businesses? And if so, then we should collect that and make sure we understand what's happening there. Um, but for the most part, no, we will not have to collect those types of returns. Great. Okay, last question. Are the 504 changes all related to affiliate determination? Or are there any other changes such as owner carry back rules, et cetera, that have changed? So, yes. Teaser uh, for the next webinar. Uh, but, you know, this, this webinar was focused on the affiliation rule changes. Um, and I would not be prepared at this moment to answer uh, other questions about the SOP changes. We're still digesting those, understanding those, uh, and we will for sure make sure to, to provide updates as, as those come into play. Okay, one more question. What documentation will you want to collect to verify potential affiliates? So the goal here is not to collect tax returns for all of these other potential affiliates. So what our practice is going to be is once we identify uh, if there's anyone that we need to do an affiliation check on, um, we're going to look at the Schedule E of their personal tax return. And probably the easiest thing at that point would be to hop on a phone call with the borrower and ask them, do you own uh, over 50% of any of these entities? Or is, is there any combined ownership between you and your spouse or a minor, minor child on any of these entities? Uh, if they say yes, then the next question will be, well, what does that entity do? And if we determine that it's in the same three-digit NEICS subsector, then we will ask to collect that tax return. I, I'm thinking that Communication between us and the, the, the borrower is going to be the easiest. Now, if, if 
if the lender is being proactive and they want to do that affiliation check ahead of time, we would just ask that you provide us with your notes or documentation showing that you covered uh, any potential affiliates with the borrower and why you determined that they were not affiliates. Great. Well, thank you all for participating. Thank you, Spencer, for preparing this for us. Um, as always, please reach out to any of us um, if you have further questions that you'd like us to address. Um, please join us for our next webinar. Um, the slides for this webinar will be sent out to everyone that RSVP'd, so you can share it with your uh, different people within your organizations that couldn't join today. Uh, we thank you for prioritizing our webinar over Nagel's webinar at the same time today. So we know who our friends are. Um, and then lastly, there will also be a recording of this webinar also, so you can pass it around. Uh, thank you, everyone. We're really excited for this. Um, like Spencer said, just in the past week, we've had four credit memos roll past our shop where the credit memo presentation was cut down almost in half with these different affiliation rules. So um, as somebody that reads all of the credit memos, I am greatly appreciative to have less pages to read. So thank you, everybody. Um, please let us know if there's anything else we can do and please respond to that survey so that we can better know what topics to capture in the remainder of our series. Thanks.